Um, and so I will start myself with the first talk on uh, OBIA and pixel-based methods combined to create land cover maps in Wallonia. And uh, then we will have uh, Ivan Rikin, who's going to present uh, automated GIS-based complex develop for the long-term monitoring of growing season parameters using remote sensing data. So I will start with my presentation. Just as a preliminary, you see the entire team of people who have, are working on that project. Um, and uh, so I'm kind of the speaker of the team here only. All of these people have contributed to the work that I'm presenting today. And this is all part of a project funded by the Walloon region um, called Walus. So the main messages I will present to you today are that uh, we combined actually object-based image analysis and pixel-based image analysis to improve the results you can get with either or uh, these, these two um, methods. And we built fairly efficient, high-performance computing tool chains using GRASS.js and using OTB. So this is different teams using different tools, but we then combine them together. And the other message is that using FOSS4G, using free and open source software for this kind of project, and I'll come back into to the question of why, really ensures transparency and sustainability of the method, of the use of the method in the context of a public administration. So just to show you where we are talking about, this is Wallonia, which is the southern part of Belgium. It's about 17,000 square kilometers. And political system in Belgium is a bit complicated, but these regions, they have uh, quite extensive competencies. Uh, the entire spatial planning, uh, economic development, uh, urban planning, but environment, transport, all these are uh, competencies of these regions. And the region is also, for large extents of the data it uses, its own data producer. Um, so there's hardly any data that is nowadays being produced on the national level, most is produced on the regional level. And so in that context, there's the need for new land cover and land use maps covering Wallonia. And the desire of the administration was not to just pay people to create these maps, and so to sell them these maps, but actually to elaborate a methodology. And that's why they asked us, the research teams, to actually work with them to elaborate a methodology which should be open, reproducible, and easily understandable by the administration. This is also in the context of different existing research projects that the different university teams had already with the Wallon region, and which then fed into this new project um, which I'm presenting today. And the general obligation, obviously, is that the results should be compliant with both what the users need, but also with the EU Inspire Directive, which has some clear rules on land cover, land use maps, um, and how they should be, uh, well, what the content should be. So to refine what we wanted to do in the project, we had a quite ex intensive interaction with the user base, means a lot of the different administrations of the Walloon region, but also universities, uh, companies, uh, anyone who might use the data, actually. And um, there was work on trying to define the legend, what, what classes are needed for a land cover map, uh, on what is the temporal resolution you need, how often do you need an update of a land cover map, what is the accuracy that you need. And what we used is a... Is a kind of a, a tool to force everyone to find their best compromise. They all had a certain number of points and they could give these points either to minimum mapping unit or to temporal resolution or to overall accuracy. So they had to distribute the points between them, which then showed, okay, if you don't have enough points to have, let's say, a very high temporal resolution, are you willing to go down a bit, but then put more emphasis on the overall accuracy? What are the, the most important aspects for you? So what came out of that is that for most users, actually, an overall accuracy of at least 
is pretty good for, for, for most of the applications. The minimum mapping unit that uh, was requested is around 15 square meters and an update frequency of, let's say, to three to five years. This is still an ongoing process, so there might be some changes in that, but this is what we have. And you can see the uh, proposed land cover legend below. So uh, actually six classes if you want to, but two of them are subdivided. So the artificial surfaces are, let's say, in ground features and elevated features and the same. And the trees and shrubs, so the higher elevated vegetation is subdivided into coniferous and broadleafed uh, deciduous trees. There's also, we're still discussing the question of uh, dividing the water into water bodies and, and water courses. The data that we have at our disposition is mainly the yearly coverage that the balloon region pays for in terms of orthophotos of its entire region, which are at a 25 centimeter resolution. And they provide four bands, so red, green, blue, and uh, near infrared. They were taken during different flights. They couldn't cover the entire region in one flight, and then ob obviously depends on weather conditions and all that. So we have a whole series of different strata uh, defined by different dates and different cameras used. Um, and we actually work individually in each strata to make sure that we don't that we take into account these differences in terms of camera and, 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 and let's say, weather or, or sun conditions. We also have a height layer, so height above ground, which was derived by photogrammetry from the images taken taking the, during the flights. And then a whole series of auxiliary vector data, which already exists because the balloon region already has a whole series of vector data, which are not necessarily up to date, it really depends on, on each layer how up-to-date they are. Uh, not always easily usable. So in the current situation, the entire road layer of the region is lines, not polygons, which obviously when you try to class at 25 centimeter resolution is not very useful. Um, and the total side of the data set is around 2.5 terabytes. So what I'm going to present today is, let's say, the core of the entire project, which is on the one side, an approach based on object-based image, image analysis, and on the other side, a uh, pixel-based approach to classify, and then a semi-automated fusion of these results in order kind of to get the best of, of both worlds. So the OBIA method uh, is a method that uh, some of you were at the workshop on Monday where we presented this more in a practical way. Um, it's a a whole collection of modules that we've been working on in the last years within the GRASS GIS software. Um, models that take you all the way from, let's say, defining best parameters for segmentation, so for creating the object, all the way to the very end to um, uh, classification through machine learning. They, it's all GRASS GIS uh, modules combined then with a Python scripts in order to create an entire pipeline of treating the data. So the idea is the whole thing should run as automatically as possible, so with as little human interaction as possible, going from cutting up the images into objects, into identifying training data, to um, then classifying. And this was all run in a highly parallelized fashion on the uh, uh, high performance computing system of, the, of my university. More in detail, how do we do this? We actually, in our research in the last years, really noted how when you try to optimize segmentation for a large area, it doesn't really work because you have such a diverse landscape that what works well in terms of cutting up the objects in one part of the image doesn't really work well in another part. Between built up areas, forests, agriculture areas, it's such different realities. And here you see from a paper from last year, where um, this is uh, Wagadougou, um, where we worked on, on this question as well. And you can see this is just to show you different values of a, a, the parameter called threshold within the, the grass segmentation. Uh, and you can see the wide variety of values that we got when we then actually optimized it locally. And that shows that there is a, a need to do actually this local optimization. And to do that, we cut up the image with 
cut lines, which is a, a, a module which implements an, an algorithm, algorithm which tries to create these cut lines in a way that it doesn't cut through objects that you're interested in. So you can see it, it, it goes around a house and then goes uh, along the streets and things like that uh, in order to have tiles which then are eas more easily uh, mergeable afterwards and the, won't perturb the, the classification. We also used a uh, super pixel approach, uh, which means that pixels which are very similar are regrouped before we go into the actual segmentation object delineation. This is mainly because it really accelerates the treatment because you divide the number of pixels or objects you have to treat by four or five, things like that. So we then segmented, so created the object tile, or little subtile by little subtile. So this runs all in parallel um, on the HPC. Um, and then it's put together again to have then a, a large segmented uh, raster. And um, so this was run with the unsupervised parameter optimization module, which we have been de developing the last years. And then we, within these small segments, we selected those for which we are, were fairly confident that we know that they are automatically by using existing data. And so saying, if this falls into what we know should be a field, and if the NDVI is high enough, then we will say, okay, this is a vegetated, low vegetated area. If it falls into forest, if it falls into known buildings, whatever. So we selected automatically the, the training data out of the objects and then ran a random forest classifier. Um, implemented in GrassGIS, but using actually R as a backend to do the, the actual uh, calculations. The other approach is the pixel-based approach, which uses OTB, and um, so offer a toolbox, and combined also in Python scripts, so running everything on the command line. And this was run on the HPC system of the other university, the Catholic University of Louvain, and what they did is they first ran um, mean shift smoothing on the images in order to avoid, let's say, at least some of the salt and pepper effect that, that you have when you have a pixel-based uh, work. They then used uh, an existing LC map that they had from another project and the height layer, and they derived shadows from the height layer as well in order to have that information. And then they used these reference data sets, again, doing some mathematical morphology and testing in order to actually identify those regions where we're pretty sure this is really, we know what this is. And they used that as, as uh, training data and classified then again. And they divided into two strata depending on the height. So they classified s separately high features and low features. And they also created two other layers, uh, but at a different resolution because those are based on Sentinel-2 one which is a uh, two-date uh, land cover map, which is especially tuned to allow a good forest classification, so to distinguish between deciduous, coniferous, and large stands and things like that. And then the other one is based on the Centu Agri project, which is part of the Copernicus uh, efforts in the last years, which is uh, a multi-temporal uh, toolbox doing multi-temporal classification to identify crops. And then we fusioned the results. So these different, so we had the OBIA results, the per pixel results for on, based on the orthophotos, and then the other two pixel based, sentinel based, and some auxiliary data, and we fusioned all that. And this is part of, let's say, also the, the methodology development and scientific uh, work being done is to, to develop methods to test different method, methods to see how that works best. There was, we kind of used as a benchmark rule based handmade fusion, but that obviously is not very reproducible and uh, auto, uh, we can automate it. And then we used on a pixel-based a Dempster-Schafer approach and OBIA, we used machine learning again to reclassify uh, based on the results of the different classifications. And what is quite interesting here, you see as an example, the, what comes out of the random forest in terms of which variables were the most important during that fusion. And you can see by the colors here that all of the different sources kind of intervene. Uh, so so if you, the red ones are from Obia, the yellow ones is the crop one, then you have the blue ones from the pixel-based. So you can really see how 
these different layers actually really work quite well together to allow you to get a better classification out of this. So what are the results? Um, so if you look at the different, uh, different approaches separately, uh, the obia, you have quite good sharp building edges, but often over-segmentation for vegetation, which then often leads to higher uncertainty on the vegetation. And this is what the map shows on the right there. The, the darker values are higher uncertainty values of classification. Um, and the per pixel approach, you had really the classical issues of salt and pepper effects, as you can see here, and but also quite a lot of problems within urban areas of correctly delineating the buildings. That always was always an, an issue. So the fusion then, um, here you see two approaches. You really have to go more into detail to see the exact differences, but what we found is that the object based obviously allowed us to, to get sharper edges and to have, let's say, a smoother outcome in general. Um, the Dempster Schaefer had a lot of difficulties combining the different resolutions, so we didn't really work quite well, whereas in the object base we could just aggregate per object information coming out of the different resolutions and it didn't really matter. Um, some of the thematically, so some of the classification came out a bit better at Dempster Schaefer, that's really class by class, you have to see that. There's quite a lot of difficulty with the class arable land, which we can already discuss whether that's actually really land cover or land use. It's a bit between the two. Um, the problem is that you need multi-temporal to work on that, but that's only the sentinel images, and those are only available at 10 meter resolution, so you get some, some problems there. So the final run is, is currently ongoing, but we expect that the completely automated system will be way over 0.85, so the, the, um, the overall accuracy that was expected. So what we can take out of this is that the um, fusion really provides a qualitative improvement over individual classifications. That in terms of, let's say, the, the approaches we tried, the object-based, machine learning-based approach of fusion was the one that looks most promising. But that obviously, the garbage in, garbage out in a certain way. So if the, if the input classifications are really not good, then fusion can correct all the issues either. So um, you can really see that in some areas. So what we did do as well is kind of this iterative approach. Uh, we try classification, fusion, and then sometimes we had to go back and say, okay, we have to improve this part of the class classification because the fusion doesn't correct it. So how does this project contribute to uh, take part here in the life of Phosphor G? Um, actually, throughout this project, this has really allowed us to test, sometimes a bit to its limits, the entire OBI tool chain that we developed in GRASS. And a whole series of enhancements that, you know, while working with them, we said, oh, it would be cool if we had this feature. Well, then we implemented that feature, and all this is obviously fed back directly into the GRASS.js code base, so available to everyone. And we even developed a few very simple new modules as well. All the scripts for the OBIA are available on GitHub, so um, anyone can, can look at them, use them, do whatever with them. And finally, perspectives. So um, we are currently finalizing the whole project, um, or let's say the land cover mapping. There is going to be one phase of manual correction still, because the idea is here to have like a one-time T0, a very, very, very good land cover map, which we can then feed into an update procedure which will be then automated. But so we said, if we have a really good land cover map to start with, the updating will be better. The idea is also to integrate land cover information into domain-specific polygons, because we, we noticed that uh, a lot of people actually, you give them a, a raw land cover map, they don't know what to do with it when they work on very domain-specific issues. And so the whole idea is then to create a whole series of land cover layers. For example, you can see here, this is the cadaster a layer with land cover inside it. This is forest management uh, information. And so we can feed this land cover layer into these different polygons, which then allows easier use by the different uh, administrations. And the other part of the project which is coming up is that we have to also create a land use map, which will also, the idea is to make it automated. So it's going to be based on a lot of existing alphanumeric uh, databases that the region has but also on the use uh, that we've been developing the last years and a method of taking the land cover map and applying landscape metrics on this land cover map to then kind of classify that into land use. Um, 
all the products, we hope, normally that's what the reason has promised us, should be open data as well, so anyone can then get them and download them. And so obviously there's the updating issue that's come, going to come up. And the other idea is that once we have this very, very nice land cover map, high precision, so high resolution land cover map across Volunia, it's just going to be a gorgeous input data set for deep learning. Because then we will have the entire data set of images and the classified and we can then train them easily that way. So, thank you. So, questions? Hi. Um, I'm having a quite similar for workflow, workflows from the like uh, detection of change of land use. I'm not using grass, I'm segmenting in our fellow toolbox with the min shift. Uh, so, I, I got interested because uh, I also have the similar data set, so two, two three terabytes. Uh, did you import the data in the data in the database of grass, or did you just link the data? This is the first question. And then I would, uh, you said that you are doing it for a temporal uh, analysis. So when you are talking about uh, getting uh, very high resolution data, we are talking about getting data that is almost every every time uh, made on a different uh, on a different uh, time period. Like I'm talking about April, May, and when we have the luck to have this area scanned. So sometimes we have a field that is the same field and it has, I don't know, corn and the next month it's bare soil because of other things. How do you avoid it? This is the first, second question. And the third, how did you uh, calculate your accuracy? Was it from the Orfeo toolbox output or with ran random quantile regression forests? or something similar. Yeah. So we're not, actually, we haven't reached the, the, the real solid validation state yet. So there's going to be actually, the actual validation is going to be ground points and, and, and so calculating overall accuracy from that. In the OBIA, we, right now, we work with the out-of-box error in the cross-validation when the random forest uh, uh, tunes, if you want to. Uh, as, as a measure, and we have some other validation aspects that we use with that. But so the, it's still something we have to discuss with the region as well, how they want to validate these projects. And the question again is, what is reproducible for them? What can they do when every year to test that? But uh, it's at, at this stage, overall accuracy calculated, looking at um, stratified overall accuracy as well. So different approaches. But so the second, the first question was about uh, importing. In this case, actually, I decided at one point I, I imported everything into Grass once, and I put it on the HPC in that form. Uh, normally, that is not necessary. You can actually leave all as a TIFF, and then uh, just link it with the R external into Grass. There's some, let's say, advantages of of, of both, but um, both is, are possible. Um, yeah, sorry, what I didn't say here, I should have mentioned in the presentation, is what I used is actually uh, the new option to create virtual raster within Grass as well. So uh, there's about six, 7,000 tiles, I think, and all these tiles have been combined into one, let's say, layer through as a virtual layer, which then allows you not, because the problem is the, the delineation of these tiles do not necessarily uh, correspond to other delineations that we have to use. and so. That way you don't worry about that. You have the entire volume region and you just say, okay, now I'm working on this and it takes those tiles it needs to work. So this also accelerates obviously treatment because it doesn't have to read the whole layer every time, just the, the tiles it needs. And there's a third question which, oh, the temporal, well, that's why we integrate the Sentinel. It's to have the multi-temporal aspect. Where, uh, where's the, oh, here. Can I ask the first yeah. <laughs> so, go ahead. Uh, What's the amount of training training points that we, uh, you used, more or less, uh, for this type of data? Uh, so so it, yeah. it really depends on each stratum that we had and on, uh, uh, and on the classes yeah. um, of what is available. So, for example, the water class, it's not that easy to have a lot of water bodies and a lot of segments in there. Forest class, it could be in the, in the millions. So actually what, what it did is we had to reduce that side also size because it actually at one point R couldn't handle this huge training data set uh, that we gave to it. And so, so we're talking about, let's say, a maximum of 
50,000 per class, but, uh, but uh, some classes were just talking in the hundreds. Yeah. So it really depends. And uh, do these classes match uh, with the Corinne Lang cover classes? Uh, yeah, maybe? the idea is obviously, as I said, it has to be in conformity with the Inspire rules, so it has to be Copernicus land cover. I just have a question about the, the virtual raster. Is mm -hmm. that one of those like GDAL XML files and where you have like all of these virtual layers? It, it's the equivalent of that, but within Grass as well. So okay. because Grass has its own raster format, and so now Grass also has the possibility to regroup different tiles into one virtual, so it's handled internally in Grass. Um, exactly the same idea. It's the same idea. So I think last question, other than that, because then we have to stop, because um, the next speaker. Yeah. Uh, has any research been done how portable is this kind of approach? If I take this approach and use it for a different part of the world, which uh, has a different geomorphological profile, would be able to provide uh, usable results? It should. The big question is what data you have available, more than the methodology, actually. That's the problem. But normally, this is this completely automated stuff. It's, then you have to feed in the right training data and things like that. I mean, the right data from which you can then select the training data if you want to. That's often the problem. If you're in other regions, you might not have enough auxiliary data to then automatically select your training data. But other than that, the, the segmentation, as I said, since it's locally optimized, shouldn't cause much of a problem. So I think we have to stop because we have next speakers come up. So thank you. And